Well, those were some of the greatest dancers in the history of movies, and one of the worst songs, I think, in the history of movies. <laughs> They're all in that dancing, a new documentary from the people who brought you that entertainment. And that's dancing is just one of four new movies that we've got on this week's sneak preview. I'm Neil Gabler. I heard you singing that song before we started. And I'm Jeffrey Lyons. And in addition to that dancing, which will have you tapping your feet and forgetting your troubles, we hope, we'll also review The River. That's the latest movie about people and the land with Sissy Spacek and Mel Gibson. And Birdie, a strange movie about a young mental patient who thinks he's a bird. And also A Passage to India, the David Lean's drama set in India in the 20s. And we'll look also at new movies on pay TV and what's new in the video stores, movies on cassette. A little history, I think, is in order. First, there was Places in the Heart, with Sally Field plugging away to save her farm from a foreclosure. And then there was Country, with Jessica Lange plugging away to save her farm from, what else, a foreclosure. And now there is The River, with Mel Gibson and Sissy Spacek as a farm couple plugging away to save their farm from foreclosure because the bank is financing a big flood control project and it needs their land. In this scene, the beleaguered farm couple take a moment from their struggle for a little intimacy. Thanks, Lily. We thought you forgot us. I'm sorry. The roof just took longer than I thought. What's wrong with it? Well, I don't know. Old age, I guess. I think it's time to day. This movie leaves no doubt about why that couple is together, as you can see in that scene. Well, after that brief romantic interlude, it's back to saving the farm. The trouble is, and in fact the reason the bank wants to build a dam, is that the farm is situated in a valley. And every time it rains, it seems the farm floods. And the pressure is getting to Gibson, especially since there's a rich landowner angling for his wife. Here, the rains have just come again, and Gibson has to push his family to batten down the hatches because his livelihood depends on it. I need to talk to you, Tom. Look, wait, look, Tom. I need to talk to you, Tom. Stop now. Lewis, get up. Leave him alone. Tom, you're pushing him too hard. He's just a kid. What's the matter with you? What's the matter with you? Come on, get the cab, Lewis. I'm not going to let you do Look, this. Look, I have this. Now, if we don't stop the river, it's going to finish it. Well, then let it in. Let it finish it before you do. I can't live like this anymore, Tom. Why don't you just clear the hell out and go live in a big family house and go away then? I don't need any help. 
anybody, do you? Nobody needs anybody else. If you saw country, that scene may seem familiar because it's a very similar scene in country. And you should be forewarned that there are several scenes in the river that are practically identical to scenes in country, word for word. The difference is that in country, I think you've got a real sense of the rhythm of farm life and of the strength of the farm community. Where in the river, aside from Sissy Spacek, nothing seems to be genuine or deeply felt. It's all pure Hollywood hokum, from the noble heroes to the bee-eyed villain to even the cornball ending. Even the situation is hokum, since it's clear that the bankers are right. Gibson can make a go of this farm. I didn't believe a second of the river, and I didn't give two hoots about anybody in it. All the flaws you say are true, but I sure gave a hoot about Sissy <laughs> Spacek. I think she's the one that makes this movie despite its flaws, despite, despite the fact that it thinks it's being very noble, that everything is the matter with it that you say it is. She is the one that makes this movie worth seeing. It's one of her best performances in, in, in years. It's the first one since she's become a mother. You see a whole new type of actress emerging. I adore Sissy Spacek, but I don't think she's doing a Ben Kingsley here. I don't think she levitates the entire movie. She did for me. I so think it prettifies and simplifies things, and I didn't like it. She's good enough for me here. So, on to our next movie, which is <laughs> That's Dancing. It's the latest from producer Jack Haley Jr.'s Busy Moviola. And this one, again, is a compilation of old clips like That's Entertainment and That's Entertainment Part 2. Only this time, Haley and his executive producer, none other than Gene Kelly, have culled some of the greatest dance numbers ever filmed in Hollywood. Here's an example of what's special about this documentary. A recently discovered segment cut somehow from the final version of one of the golden treasures of Hollywood, The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> Reason, to reason out the reason for things I can't explain. Then perhaps I'll deserve you and be even worthy of you if I only had a brain. Deserve you and worthy of you. Ray Bolger, <laughs> Judy Garland, of course, Toto, and my has that scene held up. And what a great color. movie. And why was it cut? That's what I'd like to know. Now, with rotating narrators ranging from Sammy Davis Jr. to Mikhail Barusnikov, that dancing spans the evolution of dance films, but thank goodness, along the way, one of the stops they made was in 1955, Singing in the Rain, my favorite dancing musical. And here, Gene Kelly and Donald O'Connor do a portion of the classic, impeccably choreographed Moses Supposes number. Hit it, boys. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. I wish they'd shown the whole number, however. Now, at one point, one of the movie's narrators, Ray Bolger, says that since Fred Astaire and Gene Kelly are perfectionists, they will probably never be entirely satisfied with their dancing on film. And so it is as well, ironically, with That's Dancing itself. There are a few flaws, I think. Some of the narration, especially the narration written for Liza Minnelli, is overly gushy and superficial. Sounds like a tour guide. And occasionally, some clips jump ahead, then back in time for no reason at all. At least something I could discern and some famous numbers, like the title from Singing in the Rain, which everybody knows, 
or the barn raising sequence from Seven Brides to Seven Brothers, which I think appeared in That's Entertainment or That's Entertainment Part 2 or sequel, whatever they called it, or omitted here. So that dancing doesn't stand entirely on its own, but it is enthralling, particularly the sequences, I think, with Astaire and Kelly, and especially Eleanor Powell. She's an old-time star, perhaps unknown to many younger moviegoers. Maybe no documentary, it must be said, like this can exist without a stumble or two here and there. But overall, that dancing, I think, will have you tapping your toes all the way from Fred Astaire to Michael Jackson. You would think that there was no way that anyone could possibly ruin clips of Fred Astaire dancing. This movie almost, almost. finds a way. Narration is slapped over the whole thing, and the content of the narration is almost like a parody. It's so full of cliches. Dancing is man's primitive right. way of responding to nature. All of this, you know, junk. It's slapped over all of these things. almost as if somebody's talking in the theater, and you want to say, will you keep quiet? I'm trying to watch Fred Astaire. <laughs> we do that all the time in the theater. <laughs> Nevertheless, the material itself with which they had to work is so wonderful. The Nicholas Brothers, they all turn out. It's so brilliant that you almost can't ruin it entirely. It's really You're worth right. seeing. That's you, why you can't ruin Fred Astaire, and I'm recommending this movie just Absolutely. because any movie that shows the clips of Fred Astaire Gene has Kelly, got to be recommended. Donald, Dan Daly, it's all worth it despite its flaws. Yes. Well, on to Bertie. Bertie is a drama about two buddies growing up in Philadelphia in the 60s. One of them, played by Nicolas Cage, is a red-blooded, all-American kid who loves fast cars and fast girls, not necessarily in that order. The other, played by <laughs> Matthew Modine, is a painfully shy introvert whose main interest in life is birds. Well, Bertie, as he's called, goes off to fight in Vietnam. But he returns to the States suffering from shell shock, and so the Army asks his old buddy to come to the hospital and see if he can help by reminiscing about the past. In this flashback, he recalls the time that Bertie convinced him to dress up like a bird to help him catch pigeons at a quarry. Can't hold on that long now. What's so funny? <laughs> you. You're so serious. In it? Experience. Oh, oh. oh. this isn't going to work out. I'm trying to make it to that stamp pile over there. What are you talking about? It's easy, Al. You're going to jump? No, Al. Why? No, don't jump, Bernie! Here go! Don't jump, Bernie! Bernie not only loves birds, he fantasizes about actually becoming a bird himself and flying away from all the agonies yeah. on the ground. I see you stop at the edge. I don't want you on my bike going in the water. Well, how about you? I've been practicing off my roof. I can fall 20 feet now without hurting myself. That's got to be a 40-foot drop out there, Bertie. It's all a matter of weight versus density, huh? My weight, traveling at 32 feet a second, my downward velocity isn't going to increase after I've fallen 20 feet or so. What does that mean? It means the worst thing that can happen is I get the wind knocked out of me. Oh, yeah? Yeah, but it's not going to happen anyway because I'm going to fly. How do I look? Dumb. Okay. <laughs> okay. Ready. <laughs> Well, somehow Bertie survives his adventures in the air there, but there are more misadventures for the buddies when they decide to buy an old wreck and fix it up. Only Al's father is skeptical about the whole project. Does it go? Not yet. But it will. How did it get here? We pushed it. Thank you. Hey, don't use any of my tools, you hear me? No, sir. You know that you're going to have to register that. Before you sell it, right? I don't do that, Mr. Cornbottom. Wait till you're old enough. Maybe I'll do it for you. That'd be great, Dad. Garbage, man. Later, the friends see if their efforts have been rewarded and if the car will start. <laughs> You 
got a movie like Birdie about a shy, lonely, sensitive outcast who's obviously living in a different world from everyone else, I think it should be the movie's mission to make that character credible and comprehensible and, above all, sympathetic, to show us the world through his eyes. Otherwise, he's just a freak. And if that's the mission, Birdie fails it. Everybody in the movie thinks Birdie is a nut because he is a nut. His obsession with birds never translates to us, and we don't see him suffering anything so terrible that we can even identify with his desire to fly away from it all. He just seems bizarre. Birdie looks striking, but because it never gets us inside its characters, its looks don't count for much. I don't know, Neil, I thought about this movie. I may have felt the way you did coming out of the theater, but I thought about it, and I realized I think it's a movie about loyalty. I think Alan Parker, who made Fame and Midnight Express and Bugsy Malone, never makes the same movie twice and took a lot of chances here. It is a movie that makes you feel for this young kid. Well, and it that's got what to it me, didn't make me feel. Well, it got to me a week I didn't later. Feel for Maybe it. you didn't think about it a week later. Coming out of the theater, I will grant you there's a possibility you might be momentarily disappointed. But this is one of those well, rare I'm not sure films. the movies ought to be like wine, Jeffrey, that, you know, they become better as a Maybe vintage, in this case it know, worked on me. It doesn't and always and work that way. In this case it did. So it got to me maybe a week later. I think it's just a literary me. metaphor, and I don't think it works on the level of credibility. I don't think it's real. I didn't believe these guys would be friends. I didn't believe in the sensitivity. I didn't believe that Vietnam pushed them over the edge because I think he's already over the edge. I felt completely opposite maybe a week later so we disagree <laughs> on it strange reactions here i'll wait a month and see how i feel okay but our next movie is called a passage to india sir david lean's film set in the waning days of british colonialism in 1928 it's lean's first film in 14 years furthermore he also directed great movies like bridge on the river kwai lawrence of arabia and doctors vago based on e.m forster's 1924 novel a passage to india is set amidst two cultures living side by side but never understanding each other never even caring to Judy Davis portrays a prim bride-to-be of a stuffy British magistrate posted to a provincial Indian city. She's come out to India, as he used to say, with her future mother-in-law, radiantly portrayed by Dame Peggy Ashcroft. Now, oblivious to social taboos about mixing with Indians, here she sits around the pool on a hot afternoon with a young Indian doctor and an old sage, played, by the way, by Sir Alec Guinness. No, Miss Gladstead. When I first saw Mrs. Moore, it was in the moonlight. I thought she was a ghost. <laughs> a very old soul. An old soul? Professor Godbull is using the expression in his Hindu sense. Oh. Someone who has been here many times before. Mrs. Moore, a reincarnation? Quite so. Please go on, Professor. Ah, yes. It is philosophy of some complication. But in simple terms. In simple terms, Miss Quested, life is a wheel with many spokes. A continuous cycle of life, birth, death, and rebirth until we attain nirvana. Hmm. I have contrived a dance based on this philosophy. You dance, Professor? Oh, yes. Adela? Oh, Ronnie, you're early. Um, let me introduce you, Professor Godbelly. And this. And that... What's happened to Fielding? Where's my mother? And what on earth are you doing? Well, they'll see in college. And where is he, Water Chestnut? Have one. No, thank you. We're leaving at once. Well, we can't leave like this. It's perfectly all right. Sarah! Well, that was her stuffy, prissy fiancé, mortified, as you saw there, to find her socializing with the Indians. Now, later, that shy Indian doctor you saw there, a Dr. Aziz, invites the young Englishwoman to visit the mysterious Mirabar Caves on a picnic. Then and there, a real mystery unfolds when the woman returns to town bloodied and accuses Dr. Aziz of attempted rape. And here, with Aziz already in jail, a local teacher, the only Englishman who believes in Aziz's innocence, played by James Fox, gets a lecture from that old Indian sage, a lecture about the futility of trying to alter fate. Godbelly, let me ask you something. I was under the impression that you liked Aziz. Most certainly. Then how can you be so indifferent? Don't you care what happens to him? Yes, yes, but it is of no consequence if I care or do not care. The outcome is already decided. Destiny, karma, just so. Mr. Fielding, we are all part of a pattern we cannot perceive. No doubt. Why did Mrs. Moore bring this question to Chandra Paul? To marry the city magistrate. Yes. Or to go to the Marabah with Dr. Aziz. Or perhaps to meet you. Very beguiling. But at this moment, my only interest is to do something for Aziz. Excuse me. But nothing you do will change the outcome. So do nothing. Is that your philosophy? My philosophy is you can do what you like, but the outcome will be the same. 
Well, now, with Gandhi still on my mind and with the jewel in the crown currently occupying my Sunday evenings right here on PBS, I'm beginning to feel like I've been posted to India lately. But A Passage to India is a long, sweeping, beautifully told story with breathtaking vistas and exotic settings and thousands of extras, all the elements of an old-fashioned David Lean movie movie. It's never earth-shaking and deliberately leaves the question of the doctor's guilt unanswered, just as it did in the novel. But Sir David Lean is one of the finest storytellers ever to sit in a director's chair. The events aren't cataclysmic, but they are set against a brewing storm, a people soon to erupt in revolt. So the power of the movie lies, I think, in its mood. I think there must be a place, furthermore, for a sedate, old-fashioned story like this, and there'll certainly be a place reserved for a passage to India February 6th. That's when the Oscar nominations come out. Yeah, I think it'll probably get a lot of Oscar nominations. I respect this movie. Yeah. I admire the craftsmanship and the beauty with which it's made. David Lean is one of the great directors in the history of motion pictures. But I can't say that I like this movie. I can't say that it engaged me emotionally. It's rare that you and I feel exactly the same way about Very the rare. movie. It <laughs> didn't knock me over. It wasn't Bridge on the River Kwai. Not, and Ryan's daughter came to mind, but this movie was more of mood, more of a picture of unfolding. He said very beguiling there. It leaves some unanswered questions. It's about little people involved in a huge world. It was sort of like two movies for me. The first yep. half is a David Lean epic. Then it suddenly shrinks into a courtroom drama. And the first half, you identify with Judy Davis. And then he suddenly disengages you from that identification when she accuses Aziz. And so you're left with nobody to really care about in this movie. And I think that's a problem dramatically. So two respectful yes folks. Two, yes, respectful and, and admiring yes folks. Well, we're in the middle of a new month in many parts of this country and actually a very cold month in many parts of the country and that means staying home and watching movies on TV. Fortunately, the movies this month on pay TV aren't bad. Sudden Impact, the fourth installment of the adventures of Clint Eastwood's Dirty Harry, is a kind of Dirty Harry's greatest hit, meaning it's full of action. Go ahead. Make my day. Maybe Moving on to the worst, Stephen King's Children of the Corn is still a passable thriller about weird kids in a religious cult who take over a town. But the dopey ending just about ruins it. Question not my judgment, Malachi. I'll give it a big Scarface, starring Al Pacino as the drug-crazed mobster, is a wild, vulgar, violent, campy epic. It's definitely a B-movie, but it's loads of fun. I know the street, and I'm making all the right connections. With the right woman, then no stop on me. I could go right to the top. Finally, there's Broadway Danny Rose, with Woody Allen as a struggling talent agent. It's more an hors d'oeuvre than a full satisfying meal, but at its best, it's very, very funny. What did your husband do? Um, a little bookmaking, loan shocking, extortion, like that. Speak for yourself on Scarface, Neil. <laughs> New in the video stores this month, meanwhile, is an eclectic group of movies. A thriller, a rye whodunit, a comedy about adultery, and a movie about a computer in love with its upstairs neighbor. An eclectic group indeed. In Tightrope, Clint Eastwood plays a New Orleans cop tracking down a murderer. But this time, Eastwood also explores the inner workings of his macho image. As usual, Neil was impressed by Eastwood, but as usual, I couldn't have cared less. About his mid-40s. Any suspects? 120,000. Sir Alfred Hitchcock's The Trouble with Harry is his 1955 offbeat whodunit about a stiff discovered near a sleepy New England town and what the bewildered people do about it. What's he doing on a bathtub? Gene Wilder turns up in A Woman in Red, a mildly amusing remake of a French comedy about a humdrum executive who, though married, falls in love with a poster girl. You've been dreaming about this for a long time, haven't you? And finally, there's Electric Dreams, about a computer that falls in love with its owner's attractive neighbor, silly and contrived it may be, but it's like a slick rock video. I can't play that for her. I want to squeeze you, lick you, tuck her up, and kiss you. She makes it sound like a lemon. Well, Jeffrey, now let's summarize how we felt about the major pictures that we reviewed. Jeffrey felt that The River, starring Mel Gibson and Sissy Spacek as a farm couple struggling to save their land, had its moving moments thanks largely to Spacek. Despite SpaceX, I felt it was more hokey Hollywood than Iowa, so one yes and one no. We did agree on that dancing, the documentary stringing together dance sequences. It's ineptly done and far too talky, but any movie with Fred Astaire dancing has to get a yes. We disagreed again on Birdie, the drama about a boy who wants to become a bird. Jeffrey found it moving and unusual. I felt the movie never got me to sympathize with its oddball hero, and the whole thing feels more like a literary metaphor than like real life. 
And finally, we agree on a passage to India, the beautiful epic by master filmmaker David Lean. Its craftsmanship is a lot more impressive than its drama, but few movies are as exquisite as this. Yeah. Now, you know, Jeffy, yeah, yeah. you know how you feel about Dune? Well, I was walking through a store the other day, and I saw something that struck me as the perfect gift for Jeffrey Lyons, and I wanted to give this to you oh. today. Oh. It's a Dune sandworm. See, it says ages oh. 40 and up. No, ages 4 and up. Excuse <laughs> me. And this is for oh. you. Your own Dune sandworm. Goodness sake. This is the one it. that's been sold. <laughs> well, a memento of the worst movie of the past 10 years. Thank you, Neil. I'll get you on yours someday if they make toys about it. Unbelievable. Well, that's all, and I mean, that's all for this week. <laughs> Next week, we'll review four new movies. I can never trust you, including <laughs> The Falcon and the Snowman, starring Timothy Hutton in a true story about an American who gave vital secrets to the Russians. And 1984, I wonder if I have toys made of that one, <laughs> the movie version of that book, which didn't come through last year, and which was Richard Burton's last movie. That's all next week, with other surprises too, no <laughs> doubt, on sneak previews. So until next week, I'm going to play with my Dune toy and save us the aisle seat. <laughs>